What are you going to ask me first? Who are you and what's your story? Well, okay. I'm a guy who was born in the Bronx. I, someone who has been involved in finance throughout my entire professional career. You know, my passion has always been around creating innovation in finance. I guess growing up, New York has always been the epicenter of everything. And then growing up in finance, it's just been mind-boggling. I mean, because this is where everything really happens. So I was based down in lower Manhattan, and, and I was in the World Trade Center when the first plane hit. I survived that whole day, of course. But to see the nature of people change and to see the dynamics of downtown Wall Street change, that, I think, epitomizes to me what New York is. It's an ever-changing thing. And that's what I've loved about living and working in this area. I was educated at Rutgers University. I studied economics. I became a CPA. And I've worked myself up on, you know, through Wall Street for 35 years, you know, working from an auditor to a staff accountant to a controller to a CFO to a chief operating officer. And I've run some incredibly large businesses and gotten an opportunity to expand finance throughout Latin America, Eastern Europe, and emerging Asia back at a time where merchant banks were a big thing on Wall Street, where people were still providing the seed capital for economies to emerge. What drove me was innovations in finance. So, you know, I loved organizing and structure and creating operations. And actually, one of my most significant expertise was operational efficiency. So through much of my early career on Wall Street, what I did is designed operating systems to be efficient so that we could process large amounts of transactions and understand some of the new innovations. So I grew up on Wall Street where, you know, accounting and finance was becoming very big. It went from millions to billions to trillions very quickly. And most of that centered around the development of the PC. It's a very kind of similar thing to what we're seeing with technology today in the blockchain. Where I am right now, I'm really more focused on how to bring finance to places that don't have finance capabilities. The motivation has definitely changed over the years. I stumbled across blockchain because I was looking for a solution for distributing a product. And, you know, I was working with people who were very engaged in using blockchain for the supply channels of shipping. And when I saw what a blockchain was, I said, wow, you know, this would be an amazing thing to tokenize a product and to eliminate the currency risk and to eliminate the counterparty risk. So I started doing some research on blockchain and how I could use it to distribute product to people who didn't have access to products. So, you know, for me, I was in the bond market and I wanted a solution for a sovereign country to be able to distribute bonds to their diaspora, so anybody outside of that country. And blockchain seemed like a natural fit when I looked at the operational process and what blockchain could solve in that operational process. My passion has always been on the macroeconomics of global finance. And when you look at what are the barriers, why are there people that are small producers but have no access to a marketplace? And why are there people who need supplies but can't access those supplies? I look at a blockchain as a global marketplace. I'm talking about how I can allow people to transact with people they've never met and be assured that they have the right credit profile for them to deal with. But these people 
don't have access to the markets. And being able to provide them that access, I think, is a game changer. It changes global wealth. I came out of retirement because of some of the things that Charles Hoskinson was saying about taking the long road and developing infrastructure that was sustainable for a long period of time. And, you know, that's not what is always done today. We were looking to have something that was sustainable, peer-reviewed, formal methods, supported by research and, and, and technology. It was mind-blowing to me as someone who has always operated for profit and, you know, has always operated for the best margin possible. That has never been our goal. If that were our goal, it would be nothing near what it is today or have the potential. Tell us about the evolution of Cardano. So the concept is to create an economic ecosystem. And the Cardano community is what ends up owning that, that ecosystem. But there are a lot of things that go into building the capabilities of that ecosystem that are, some of them are technical, some of them are non-technical. I think in building the Cardano community, you know, looking at input-output global as the technology provider, the Cardano Foundation as the stewards of the Cardano community, and Emergo as the entity responsible for incubating adoption and development on the Cardano platform. When, when you bring all those things together and you think about, well, how do you create liquidity in a cryptocurrency? Well, you have to get it listed on exchanges. You have to um, create adoption by institutions as well as a, a large amount of retail investors. You have to create a a global community so that you're not concentrated to one jurisdiction or another. I think that one of the great things about bringing so many diverse players, and I mean both community and both from the vendors that service the Cardano community, is that you're not getting one view. It's not one political view, it's not one economic view, it's a culmination of many different views. And I think that's the strength of the Cardano community. We never talked about IOG as a, as a company. We talked about what we could achieve together using technology. It was all about being able to provide financial services to those people that did not have access to financial services. It wasn't about replacing a database with a blockchain. It wasn't about replacing an application with a DeFi solution. It was about providing something to a people that didn't have access to it. This is just a new product. But from that new product comes new ideas which we can transport to places that don't have access to financial services. And I think that's where the real empowerment is. The big joke in the firm is I'm Mr. Interoperable. I'm Mr. Interoperable because I've been the chief operating officer of an investment bank that had a very large technology budget. And I never wanted to use that budget to reinvent my systems. That's the last thing I want to do because an investment bank is not a technology firm. They use technology to improve their margins. And if you're not using technology to improve your margin, you're wasting your money. So if you're going to get financial service industries to use the blockchain, you have to make it interoperable, meaning they don't have to reinvent their entire infrastructure. So I think that that is, is critical because there are hundreds of billions of dollars, if not trillions of dollars of infrastructure that exists, and that isn't going to change overnight. But the data is good data, and, and the uh, blockchain can simply process what data is fed. I've always said interoperability is also important because there doesn't have to be one blockchain that wins. You know, 
a lot of these blockchains do very different things, and a lot of the communities are in this blockchain or that blockchain for their very specific reasons, but it doesn't mean that they can't transact with other blockchains. And I don't think there has to be one clear winner, certainly not on the infrastructure side. And to allow applications to go from blockchain to blockchain, I think is just healthy for the industry. When I think about Cardano and Cardano's growth, I think about adoption. Right now, through 2021, we've laid a really great foundation for Cardano. Cardano as a blockchain is efficient, it's cheap, it's robust. There are things that we've added to it, like Voltaire, the voting system, Catalyst, a system that will allow for applications to grow on Cardano and for the Cardano ecosystem to do more and more, and, and for the Cardano community to have that direct say in where it goes. I think a lot of the technical work that is doing to make it interoperable and easy to, to move applications from one platform to another make Cardano, again, more robust. I think the work that we're doing in Hydra to make it faster and cheaper, make it more robust. I think the concepts of a stable coin to make it create a, a stable currency on the platform, again, will make it more robust. So I only see that we've laid a really good foundation and now working with the community is how do we build that nice, beautiful, efficient house. But the house is not great if it consumes too much electricity or uses too much petrol. And so I think that building that with the conscious of it being incredibly efficient, power efficient, efficient from an economics perspective, I think are the important things that we need to continue to evolve over the next five years. It's a business that isn't motivated by pure profit. It isn't that we don't make a profit. It's just not the primary motivation. Doing good for the world, providing finance to people that don't have access to it, providing a capability to a sovereign uh, country that doesn't have that capability right now is some of the things that I think really motivates Charles Hoskinson and therefore it gets pushed down to the rest of the company and it really motivates the rest of us. Imagine I spent 35 years in a career figuring out how to extract another penny out of a nickel, you know, constantly looking to improve my margins. And now with IO Global, I have to figure out how to provide resources to get projects done without trying to pressure people to improve their margins. And, you know, as anybody in IO Global will tell you, that's, <laughs> it doesn't come natural for me. I always have that moment where I'm like, are you sure we really need to do this? And I wear that CFO hat, but at the end of the day, I wouldn't have come out of retirement to do something as a job. It's all about me providing resources so that we can accomplish what Charles Hoskinson's vision is. It gives me purpose.